All right, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, thank you, Bill, for the, the generous introduction. All right, my name is Chris Reed. I'm with the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Um, I'm gonna give you an update, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to give you an update of, of what we have cooking in Louisiana in terms of coastal prairie stewardship and research. Uh, a few years ago, in 2009, really, we, had a, we made some uh, game-changing discoveries in Louisiana. Historically, of course, we had a lot less of the coastal prairie in Louisiana. We had about two and a half million acres or so. And for the longest, we thought that we had really, we thought the only thing we had, the only prairies we have left were uh, just railroad remnants and a few urban remnants. But, but the game changer was that in, uh, starting in 2009, we started discovering some pretty nice, uh, not small chunks of unplowed prairie on the landscape. And it's those sites that I'm gonna be talking about today, mainly about our stewardship actions. Uh, just a little background on status. Uh, in terms of coastal prairie in Louisiana, we had about two and a half million acres. Um, historically, uh, we uh, have railroad remnants, which are probably the, the best known and best studied. Um, railroad remnants, a generous estimate of acreage would probably be about 500 acres. Uh, we have a few urban remnants. Uh, this, uh, the top photo is uh, an industrial park in Lake Charles. And we have some prairie restoration or recreation uh, projects. The, the Eunice Prairie, which most of you have probably at least heard of, and uh, uh, Durald Prairie, which is a kind of a disjunct piece of Lacassine National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, mitigation banking is starting to become pretty important, uh, an important for, tool for prairie restoration or recreation in Louisiana. We have an old bank, the Lacassine Bank, that's about 15 years old, but we have uh, six sites that are uh, pretty new, new banks and some more proposed banks, uh, some of which actually have some, some unplowed remnant prairie on it, but most of it's gonna be starting from scratch. But mitigation banking is gonna be an important topic in, in prairie conservation in Louisiana and in, in the near future. So this map shows the uh, historical extent of prairie in Louisiana. It ranged from Lafayette north to Ville Platte, and then it kind of makes a triangle uh, to Lake Charles and then, and then westward to Texas. Uh, now I said we've been finding some, some new remnants in the last few years, and uh, if you look at the, the overall picture, uh, really the heart of Acadiana, that is, um, that's really all rice. The, the only prairie remaining in this, in this area are the railroad remnants. But uh, land use is a bit different over in the Lake Charles area, both to the southeast and to the west and southwest of Lake Charles. Uh, 200 years ago, the entire prairie was open range. It was all just a big sea of free grass. Uh, the range uh, in, the, in the more prime soils in the eastern part, the larger part, uh, have been converted to rice and to a less, lesser extent sugarcane. But the soils in the Lake Charles area and the Vinton area, while it was still clearly prairie, uh, the soils were a little less fertile. The clay pan was a little leakier. A lot of it has been put in rice and various other crop, row crops at one time or another, but there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of grazing land in the Lake Charles area. And it's in this, this pasture, ag, rangeland matrix that we've been finding some pretty respectable uh, prairie remnants out on the landscape. And I, I tend to refer to those as the, the rangeland remnants. The, these sites are, uh, they've never been plowed, but they've been grazed to various degrees and a few other sources of, of um, occasional soil disturbance, but they've never, never actually been plowed and converted to crops. Uh, this is one such prairie. This is actually the first one we discovered. It's uh, about 500 or so acres, and uh, it has the, the classic landscape features, pimple mounds, uh, wet depressions, et cetera. Uh, this is a, in our, in our wildlife action plan, we have a chapter devoted to conservation opportunity areas. Most of our conservation opportunity areas, COAs, were determined using a process where we uh, predicted, uh, we identified areas of high predicted species richness in the state and high habitat diversity. Uh, the two COAs here, the Calcasieu Prairie and Sabine Prairies, we kind of carve those out just using the eyeball and brain method because we know they're important. This is the, this is the part of Louisiana where we still have some nice chunks of prairie. Uh, all in all, we found uh, seven, uh, seven remnants uh, they range widely in size, 900 acres at the largest to about 100 acres at the smallest, averaging about 300 acres. So these aren't teeny tiny, like a 10 acre piece here and there. They're, you know, they're up to several hundred acres. So pretty, pretty decent in the size department. And um, 
And going back to another thing we like about the, the coastal prairie rangelands is that they, they have some degree of de defensibility. They're well removed from civilization. Uh, they're, bound, uh, they're bordered by various, of course, ag one, but also pasture, and uh, both, both improved pasture and then rangeland that occurs on uh, previously plowed land, which is kind of uh, what they call a go back land or go back prairie. Um, so we like the defensibility and we like the connection potential of these rangeland remnants. Uh, so these are some basic characteristics. Uh, starting in 2010, uh, we, we've been engaging landowners. We're working with three uh, large landowners. These are big ranches. Uh, so all of these sites that we know of are, are privately owned. Uh, they tend to be on the low elevation range. Uh, rangelands globally don't occupy prime ag, ag land. They you know, tend to occupy either arid climates, semi-arid climates, rocky soils. For whatever reason, not prime ag land. And these, these sites are low elevation. They go right to the edge of the intermediate marsh and extend. The highest prairie that we have is about 15 feet above sea level. And this site, uh, the 15 foot site, does have some nice mesic flats with a uh, little blue stem, pretty good continuous stands. Uh, so these prairies are unplowed, but they have been beaten up. Uh, they're, they're grazed, uh, intensity varies, grazing scheme varies. Um, fire is something, is a, is a a practice that's fallen out of range management in southwest Louisiana uh, for a number of reasons. It's just, they just don't do it anymore. It's been replaced by aerial, aerial broad, broadcast herbiciding. So all of these sites have a lot of noise, a lot of brush, uh, a lot of ecological imbalance, but the, the promise is obvious. The promise just by walking through, you can see all, a lot of uh, high, highly conservative prairie plants, high-end grasses, but then they're intermixed a number of weeds, uh, grasses that are increasers, uh, plants that indicate soil disturbance. Uh, so it's a mix, but the promise is there. Um, I'll go through this quickly. Some of the basic, uh, really the three main landscape uh, positions on our coastal prairies, just like they are in, in the alpha soft soils in, in Texas. Uh, broad flats in, the, uh, in between the pimple mounds. Uh, these range from wet, really sedgy, rushy, to mesic with lots of uh, little blue stem and other things. I'll have some pictures in a minute. Uh, pimple mounds, uh, these range from uh, very small, maybe foot and a half tall to 10 feet across to uh, mounds in, in one site that are large enough to you, you can nearly hide a, truck behind, a pickup truck behind them. Uh, moisture regime in the mounds ranges from, from mesic to dry, and we have some mounds, some of the bigger mounds that have plants that you would otherwise find in, in uh, sand hills to the north into the longleaf pine range. And then potholes, various sizes and shapes, uh, degree of definition on the landscape, but uh, potholes tend to be sedgy, rushy. Uh, they also, in some cases, have uh, more or less like a little, a little capture of the freshwater marsh in, embedded in a prairie. This is a LIDAR image of uh, one of our prairies. Uh, this is a Gray Ranch. It's uh, actually, the prairie extends about 900 acres. Uh, this is kind of the core area where we have some research going on, but that's prairie as well, and all the way down here and kind of makes a little peninsula. This is intermediate marsh. Uh, the uh, couple of features, you can see the pimple mounds. They stick out pretty nicely. Uh, there's a, a really well-defined pothole up there. There's a, this little green one here, another really well-defined pothole. Uh, this little fringe here, the green fringe, that is uh, marsh fringing prairie. It's dominated by marsh hay cord grass for the most part. Uh, and just another, another LIDAR image of, a, of about a 100-acre prairie that we're working on. Uh, again, the pimple mounds are really obvious. Uh, the southern area that's, that's in, in red that's, that's on average higher than the rest of the property it has a lot of big brush on it that we're work, kind of trying to whittle away at. Uh, some pictures. This is uh, uh, the site that I, uh, this site, and this is an intermound flat. Uh, lots of Rhinchospora, uh, Spartina patens, Marche cord grass, a uh, variety of other sedges and rushes, probably about five or six species of rushes, so very heavy on the sedge, sedge and rush department. Uh, some pimple mounds are scattered about. There's a mound, and there, there are a couple scattered about. Uh, this is, seems to be a, a phase of coastal prairie uh, that fringes, the, or at least occurs in close proximity to the intermediate marsh that repeats itself across our, our sites. And this is a, a prairie that's dominated by Spartina patens, marsh hay cord grass. Um, it does have an intermix of species that you don't typically find in, in marshes, brackish or intermediate marshes that have marsh hay cord. 
Uh, it has a lot of species that you'd otherwise find on longleaf pine flatwoods, for example. Uh, this was an interesting phase of that uh, Spartina-dominated prairie where uh, Hibiscus leucophilus, some people lump it with the regular old woolly mallow, uh, Hibiscus laciocarpus. Um, I split it out, it seems, seems to hold up. But uh, So in this zone we have a, a mix of both Spartina patens, also maiden cane, which is in my experience strictly fresh, uh, Pancum hematoman, uh, this hibiscus really abundant, uh, switchgrass scattered about, so it seems to be a pretty distinctive phase. Uh, you'll see in the background a uh, nice line of Chinese tallow tree occurring along a drain. Uh, we've done some, we've done a little bit of herbicide work ourselves, trying to work on that stuff, but we have plans for the site, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. Of course, uh, Texas coneflower, one of the mac daddies of the prairie. Um, this is on a wet flat at Gray Ranch. Um, uh, just some other, I have just a few more pictures of various landscape positions. Uh, this is a wet flat with um, Hyptosolata and Florida Paspalum, which are two highly conservative prairie plants. Uh, this, this view kind of backed off. This is a kind of a mesic, this is one of our higher elevation prairies. Uh, so we have, we have some pimple mound action going on. That kind of cast of yellow is uh, Solidago tortifolia. But we have uh, Liatris, uh, Pycnostachia, switchgrass, little blue stems, the, the most dominant matrix grass. If you didn't have that big line of uh, wax myrtle on Chinese tallow tree, it would be pretty breathtaking. Uh, but we have plans for that, wax myrtle and, and, uh, and tallow tree. Uh, and uh, Silphium grassily, this is on a, on a mesic flat, one of the higher elevation flats uh, with a bunch of uh, rosin weed. Pimple mounds, this is, a, one, of the lar this is a, one of our sites that has really big, big mounds with uh, plants that you would otherwise find at, at sandy soils in Fort Polk. But uh, this extensive pocket gopher activity, I showed some of our zoologists this picture and they, they had speculated it was the Baird's pocket gopher. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's, well, it can't, that cannot be common. It's, it's rare overall in Louisiana bear, it's pocket gophers, but uh, I'd be shocked if there's much more, many more populations south of I-10 in Louisiana. But these, the mounds on this side are just churned up with uh, pocket gopher activity. Uh, one of the biggies on the pimple mounds is slender blue stem. It occasionally uh, finds its way off onto some of the drier flats, but it's mostly a mound species. Uh, this is luxurious growth coming back after a fire. Looks really uh, scrumptious if you're a cow. Uh, some other pimple mound plants, uh, blue sage, uh, uh, ashy sunflower, etc. cetera. Um, I find myself when I'm botanizing on these prairies, I kind of mound hop because the mounds are so, they're so interesting and uh, just, you know, the floor is fairly predictable, but then again, some plants are on one mound and not on others. And there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, I guess, uh, high species turnover, you know, beta diversity with the mounds. Uh, so what have, what have we been doing? We, our, our coastal prairie conservation is, is a major, is a top priority for our agency. And we've been working on this since 2013. We've implemented some research and some on the ground uh, fire for effect stewardship. So what we've been doing to date, uh, our major activities are one, prescribed burning. That's a, that's a biggie. Uh, we've been putting together fire crews from our agency and uh, uh, in 2014 we burned about 800 acres on, of uh, remnant prairie on private lands and then we put another, did another 1,200 or so acres this year. So we're going to keep up the burning. One other thing I want to say about burning, and I mentioned it earlier, is that uh, prescribed fire has kind of fallen out of use in range management in southwest Louisiana, even in the longleaf country. Um, one of our intermediate term goals the, the, these ranch managers, they, they see the value in fire, they want to do it, but for a variety of, of reasons, they're apprehensive, they, maybe, they just, maybe it's forgetfulness, I don't know, but uh, every time we execute a successful uh, prescribed burn, we're, we're demonstrating that, that fire can be safely and, and, and successfully used as a management tool. They value it, they just kind of, I think, forgot how to do it. So as an intermediate term goal, we're hoping to uh, restore the practice of uh, the use of prescribed fire as a routine range management practice, both on, uh, on all types of rangelands. And when I say all types of rangelands, uh, prairie remnants, uh, there's uh, another flavor of range that uh, kind of resembles, uh, has some, some physical structural resemblance to actual prairie. So just as a range management tool in general, we'd like to see an increase in use of prescribed fire. 
Uh, we've been doing some chemical brush control, some targeted herbiciding. Uh, woody encroachers tend to be yopon, wax myrtle, Chinese tallow. Those are the biggies. Uh, we haven't done a whole lot of chemical work to date. We've done about 300 acres, but we uh, have some, some uh, I anticipate some more funding uh, this coming year and the next few years. I think we're going to get really heavy handed about the, especially the mechanical side. There are a couple of sites where we'd like to do some mulching uh, in concert with chemical work and, f and follow all that up with fire. So uh, we're going to get serious about the chemical and mechanical side in the next uh, year or two. Uh, all these sites, I'm a botanist. I've been visiting these sites. Uh, for two of them, I've made a, a pretty decent, respectable effort to collect voucher specimens for all the plants present. I'm sure I didn't get everything. That, that'll probably never happen. but. Um, so I'm collecting plants on these sites and, and I'm kind of envisioning a, a publication in the near future uh, relative to the flora of uh, rangeland coastal prairies. Uh, we have a field experiment in progress that we started in 2013 uh, on a site that's been uh, never been plowed but it's uh, been grazed. It, the grazing scheme, it, it gets grazed all growing season. There's no growing season rest so a lot of the high-end grasses like little blue stem Indian grass have decreased. And you have a lot of carpet grass, smut grass, weedy, th you know, increasers. So we have a cattle exposure experiment going on. Now this is a long-term study. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more about that shortly. And uh, we're also working with uh, Larry Alain. We're at least partially funding some of his work. He'll be doing pollinator surveys over the next year or so. And we've started doing the background work. I'm looking forward to getting Larry out to some of the sites that we're working on. And we're starting to work on getting access to these sites, getting Larry access to the sites. So just a few pics of, uh, of some of our prescribed burnings. This is Gum Cove Prairie near the town of Hackberry. Um, we burned it in January of this year, and this is post-burn. Uh, the pimple mounds, uh, you can see, kind of stick out pretty nicely. This is just low, wet, mound, pimple mound prairie. Um, we had done a herbicide treatment in uh, fall of 2013. This has some really big brush on it, wax myrtle and yopon. Uh, the herbicide treatment was pretty good. We, we killed about 70% of the brush um, stone dead. It, uh, it hadn't, I guess, melted down enough to, to be combustible. So when we burned, it just, it's still standing dead brush. Uh, but this is a site that I'd like to get into some mulching on. In fact, uh, that's, uh, in terms of mulching, that's the first priority site. It's such really big brush, and uh, we hope to get that mulched uh, this summer of 16. Uh, Gray Ranch has uh, about 900 acres of unplowed prairie, um, and these, these are, we, we conducted four prescribed burns this year, and this is the, just the different burn units. Um, this is the results of our March burn. Um, it provided some really good botanizing, I'll tell you that. Uh, this is a couple of months post-burn. Um, we got a really, it, it burned pretty cleanly. One thing we have, one trouble we have on this site is, is fuel quality and quantity. Uh, you know, it's, there's a lot, of, a lot of carpet grass and a lot of stuff that's just nowhere near you know, little blue stem quality when it comes to fuel. Uh, but all in all, it burned pretty cleanly. We top killed a lot of brush and uh, we'll burn it again uh, this year, early next year. Uh, we did a, a summer burn on that southern unit, which uh, is really close to the marsh. Uh, this area had been rested for about a year, so it had a lot of fuel. Most of it was old field broom sedge, bushy broom sedge. But Spartina Paytens, uh, Marche Cord, was, there was a lot of that, and that's a, very, uh, that's a very good fuel. And we got a really good hot burn in June, and it really uh, smoked some wax myrtle, um, top kill it anyway, and we you know, smoked some, uh, some yopon as well. And that, that brush was getting to the point where in, in places it was starting to, starting to really suppress the grasses, and that was kind of a critical point. Um, you know, once the stuff, once these big shrubs grow together, they suppress fine fuels, and you get fireproof thickets, and, uh, so hopefully this will set that back. And we did another burn on gray in August that was kind of experimental in nature. This was immediately after the burn. All in all, it was pretty wimpy, but it was probably worth doing. Uh, the fuel was just really light, carpet grass, smut grass. But uh, if you contrast all this browned out baccarus with the, the background, which is outside, it definitely, it at least top killed a bunch of brush, which is, you know, it's a plus. I mean, it's, it's, it was worth doing, even though it wasn't exactly an inferno. Uh, so on gray, we're also doing a cattle exclosure experiment. And uh, in 2013, in the spring of 13, we erected nine 50 by 50 meter cattle exclosures scattered about. And 50 by 50 meters is about six tenths of an acre. Uh, so they're not, not exactly small. It's a lot of fencing. 
Uh, our, the main question we're trying to, or the main thing we're trying to de determine with this experiment is uh, the recovery potential of a, of a prairie that's been uh, pretty heavily grazed, but it's never been plowed. It has this mix of conservative and uh, conservative species increasers, disturbance indicators. Uh, I'm really particularly interested in, in monitoring the fate of individual species. You know, the prediction is that, that carpet grass uh, it's not competitive against your taller grasses, so I'm, I'm hoping, I'm thinking, I'm predicting, hypothesizing that it's going to uh, decrease at the expense of the taller bunch grasses, even if those taller bunch grasses tend, are you know, weedy ones like Oldfield Broom Sedge. Uh, but the little blue stem is peppered out, and it is in some of the disclosures. Um, Yankee weed or, or dog fennel is, is really abundant on the mounds and the higher flats, so very curious to see what's going to happen over time with, with that disturbance-loving species. So it's an interesting study, but it's a long-term study. Uh, I'd like to run it for 10 years minimum. Uh, so I'd, we've, as far as time goes, we erected the exclosures in 2013, did some herbicide, the herbicide treatments in late 13 with some mop-up work in 14. We just this year in March got our first burn. So um, I don't really have any results. I've done uh, some veg sampling this uh, summer and fall. So I'll do some, do some number crunching, not expecting anything major with this short period of time. Uh, so this is a long-term study, 10 years minimum. The fencing will probably last a lot longer than that. Uh, one thing that was noticeable, there's a lot more fuel inside the exclosures. This is after over a, over a full season of um, being exclosed. So the fire burned a lot cleaner as compared to the outside area. Um, so near future, we're gonna keep up our, our momentum. We're gonna continue burning on uh, uh, this coming year in 2016, we're going to start burning sites that we've burned before, so I'm looking forward to seeing the results after, after the second and third burn on a site. Uh, we're going to, like I said, we're going to, uh, anticipating some more funding in the future, we're going to do some heavy-handed, uh, targeted uh, herbiciding of, of uh, wax myrtle and yopon, uh, with, along with mechanical mulching. Uh, so I think that's going to make a big difference, in, certainly in the aesthetics of some of these sites. Um, uh, I'll be working to some degree with Larry on, on pollinator surveys. Uh, one thing that I really, I'm hoping we can get, I can get my coworkers on is uh, zoological inventories. We would like to uh, uh, inventory uh, herps, invertebrates, especially crawfish, and uh, small mammals. So hopefully we can get some more, more animal information. Um, also, I, I'm kind of working on this flora of the coastal prairie rangelands. That'll probably be published as an online resource at least a version one. And the idea is for that to be uh, useful, not just on coastal prairie remnants, but also on just rangelands in general. Uh, the flora, the checklist will be, com will be based on study of remnants, but they're also, they're very, a uh, lot of ecological imbalance, so it's gonna have plenty of weeds too. Um, uh, we're gonna keep doing the cattle exclosure experiment, uh, devote a lot of time to that. Um, We've, uh, one of my coworkers especially has started a little, uh, or starting a, uh, kind of kicking off a campaign. Uh, she's calling it uh, Discover Louisiana Beyond the Swamp. And uh, there are a lot of habitats, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of amazing diversity in Louisiana that's just been flat out, flat out forgotten about. And Coastal Prairie is probably one of the biggest, the most forgotten about habitats in Louisiana. Uh, even longleaf pine grasslands and pitcher plant bogs a lot of people just aren't aware of this. So we want to kind of attack the, uh, you know, the fact that outside of Louisiana, you know, maybe not in Texas, but you know, a lot of people think of Louisiana as much as swamps. And inside Louisiana, oh, it's swamps, bottomland hardwoods, and some sort of generic pine forest, envisioning some sort of densely stocked you know, plantation-like setting. Uh, so we're going to, Coastal Prairie in this campaign will be featured prominently. We're going to do YouTube videos and uh, take advantage of social media. Uh, to try and raise awareness and appreciation of Louisiana's natural heritage, uh, so, so much of which has been forgotten. Uh, another aspect that I'm not really qualified to do, but I'd like to see with this uh, cattle exclosure experiment is a below ground portion. Uh, there, that's a whole different world that I, I know very little about, but it would be nice to get some more, uh, some more partners, some more folks coming in and doing research, utilizing the, what we, the setup that we already have. Um, so one of the, there are two kind of intermediate objectives we had. I mentioned one earlier, and that's stimulate, that's, uh, stimulate or uh, invigorate prescri use of prescribed fire in Louisiana. I think to some extent we're doing that. Uh, one of the prairies that we're working on 
uh, the ranch manager was telling me this summer, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and uh, roller chop 800 acres and follow it with fire. And I, I, I want to I take, I hope he's looking at the stuff we're doing and saying, okay, I want to do that too. And really, because they, they do a lot of burning in the marsh, but the prairie just gets neglected. It's just the, the old model of, um, you know, aerial spraying, no fire. So the fact that he's talking about doing some mechanical work and doing some vigorous burning of a pretty large area, I'm, I'm hoping he's... Uh, I'm hoping we're at least giving him some inspiration. Uh, so fire, you know, in, uh, invigorating and uh, inspiring people to, to go out and burn. And, uh, but, you know, I say this is the real Louisiana, and this is the forgotten Louisiana. And the, if you take somebody out to one of these prairies, um, and it's brushy, weedy, a lot of noise, you take the average person out there, and they're gonna, you tell them it's prairie, they're going to be like, oh, whoopee-doo. But if we can knock the rough edges off and get these things, look, get, get these prairies looking, uh, looking like prairie and in good shape, and then publicize that, that'll help with our, our raising appreciation. So we want to, uh, with our stewardship work, we want to unveil the real Louisiana and, and show that to to the country. So, um, as far as acknowledgments go, we're currently funded by a state wildlife grant. Uh, I have some other things in the works. Uh, the landowners uh, have been more than gracious. Uh, we're working on uh, three landowners and then a couple of other uh, mitigation banks, and uh, we greatly appreciate their interest in just allowing us to go out there, and, and uh, we're developing those relationships, and they're getting better and better with each year. And uh, we've certainly had a lot of help from other agencies, NRCS, Ducks Unlimited, LSU, and then my wildlife and fisheries coworkers have been many that have participated in burns, and help in various aspects of the work. All right, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Do we have time? Or? Yes. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned uh, as far as a woody wax burn. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the question had to do with um, uh, uh, mots, uh, uh, thickets, uh, little islands of woody vegetation on the prairie. Um, I really don't know what those were like in Louisiana. I don't know how often they were. Um, there seems to be an interesting feature. If you drive, look south on, on I-10, just not too far into Louisiana, there's some clusters of live oak. I don't know what's going on there, but they appear to be just little clumps of live oak, so I don't know if there's something with soils. I don't know enough about these sites to know, as far as uh, woody thickets, you know, what's natural and what's not. So uh, honestly, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Are you uh, going to develop, a, or have you developed a cost per acre versus time, uh, reclaiming these woody, brushy areas and uh, going back to prairie? Not the whole package. Uh, the question. Yeah, uh, as far as you're talking about the whole restoration package, chemical, mechanical, fire, just cost per acre to return it to, to restore it. Yeah. No, I don't have a, a total package cost. Uh, yeah, we have cost per acre of, of the various components. Um, burning ourselves is about $10 an acre. The herbicide work we've done is about 150 an acre. But I haven't done, you know, factoring in time and other, other cost components, I haven't done a detailed cost per acre for total stewardship, total restoration. And you could eventually come up with that and then the guidelines for people who measure again? Yeah. Other question? Yeah. Did I understand that correctly? There's been one burn on those prairies, on those brush piles that we've reclaimed so far, or has there been more than one? Uh, just one on each site that I've mentioned. Uh, of one, one burn on each of six sites. Uh, we're not, we're, we're not, as far as burn timing goes, uh, we're kind of experimenting. Uh, we have imperfect fuel to deal with. We have a variety of factors, so, uh, yeah, 
we're, we're experimenting. We don't have a, a, a really solid foundation for saying we're going to burn here because of this reason. We are operating under the kind of the assumption that f fire is better than no fire, and then we're going to kind of tweak things over time as we learn more. Uh, but fuel limitation does dictate a lot. That August burn just didn't burn worth a flip. We also tried to burn in April, and that didn't burn worth a flip. So in some cases, we just, yeah. Was it uh, water issue, excessive water on the site? Uh, it's just a lot of, lo it's really, uh, there's the absence of things like little blue stem, and there was the presence of a lot of sedges and rushes, which were bright green and just, yeah. How did your program get started? What's that? Uh, and two th uh, this, this, all this got started in 2009. How are we doing for time? One more question after this. And okay. Okay. In 2009, a coworker of mine, our, our dear study leader, I don't know what led to it, but he used to work for one of these landowners, and he wanted to take me on to some of his. He studied model duck nesting uh, ecology, so we went on to the, some of these sites, and then we went on the, the first aerial that I showed, Scotts Prairie. Um, we, it was obviously a prairie remnant. It's like, oh wow, this is a prairie remnant, and it's like 500 acres, so. That's a biggie. That kind of doubles the amount of known <laughs> prairie acreage in Louisiana. So that's what it started with, a, a you know, fortunate field trip that uh, led to the discovery of these sites. One, one question. And one, one last question. Uh, so are you thinking in terms of uh, species diversity number to get back to a healthy prairie? Do you have a number? Like how many species do you have in mind? And is that about where you want to get to in a matter of balance? I don't really approaching it from that way. Uh, when we're dealing with these, these remnants, uh, they're loaded. They have a lot of species diversity, a lot of native plant diversity. Um, I'm not, certainly not looking to augment that with planting. Um, I guess it's another way to ask the question, is there a quantitative metric you're using to judge success, or is it qualitative visual? You know? Right now, it's eyeball and brain. Uh, quantitative measure would be uh, you know, brush reduction. That would be a quantitative measure. Uh, but as far as species diversity, no. And we also have to realize that we don't have complete control over these properties. We can't dictate the, you know, how they're managed. We can only do stewardship where we can. We, we don't, and, and in most cases, we're not really privy to the grazing schemes. We just, we're not sitting at the, at, we're not on the board, and we, we don't have any, really, there's not a whole lot. We can try and have a positive influence on grazing practices, but that's pretty nebulous right there, and a very, very long-term endeavor. Uh, a lot of, uh, these, these, Property owners are very, very set in their ways and are resistant to change. So, uh, really, what we're trying to do is uh, knock out brush, restore fire as a common management practice, and gain whatever benefits frequent burning give us on the prairies and any any benefits the, that those are. That? No problem.